Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the virtual Friends of Greek Art Lecture from Athens to Raleigh, Visual Representations of Africans on Ancient Greek Vases. This lecture is made possible by the Friends of Greek Art Endowment. This endowment supports the NCMA's Ancient Greek, Italian, and Roman collections and associated programming. Um, before we start, I just want to uh, remind you that you can uh, ask questions in the chat and we will address the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, also, if you are interested in the live captioning, you can uh, do that by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if it is already activated and you want uh, not to use it, you can press that same uh, button as well. For those who don't know me, my name is Caroline Rushelo. I will be the host um, for this program. I am the curator of ancient collections here at the museum. And this includes the material culture of ancient Greece, Italy, and um, Rome. I will also introduce our speaker for today. Um, this is very exciting for uh, us. Uh, let me just pull up my notes quickly. Um, like I said, very exciting for us to host um, this Friends of Greek Art Lecture once again in October on, um, in October every year. So beginning in the sixth century BCE, the vase painters of ancient Athens began to decorate their ceramics with images of foreign people, both mythological and real, including Amazons, Scythians, Persians, Thracians, and Africans. Out of these groups, imagery involving Africans often occur. In most of the world's major museums with collections of ancient Greek material culture, vases decorated with depictions of Africans in mythological settings, as well as scenes of daily life can be found. There is one such vase in the NCMA's collection. One side features Heracles departing for Mount Olympus and the other, King Memnon and his squire getting ready for the Trojan War. With the collection reinstallation, I thought it was time to bring the mythical King Memnon, uh, the King of Ethiopia, into the limelight in the ancient Greek, Italian, and Roman galleries. I thus called upon an expert on this subject to participate in the Community Voices Project. A scholar I had seen a lecture on the topic a few times virtually, Naji Olia. Naji is a PhD candidate at, in the Program for Mediterranean Art and Archaeology at the University of Virginia and the incoming Bothmer Fellow 22-23 in the Greek and Roman Art um, Department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He is a specialist in the archaeology and art of archaic and classical Greece with a specific emphasis on pottery produced in the city of Athens. He's interested in issues including identity, ethnicity, and how interactions between ancient Greeks and the non-Greek people of North Africa, the Near East, and the Italian peninsula influenced Athenian material and visual culture. Naji's doctoral thesis, Constructing the African in Ancient Greek Vase Painting, Images, Meanings, and Context, explores visual representation of African individuals appearing on Athenian ceramics from the sixth through the fourth centuries BCE and the socio-cultural milieu in which the creation of the vases was made possible. Today's lecture entitled From Athens to Raleigh, Visual Representations of Africans on Ancient Greek Vases explores the different kinds of representations of Africans in Greek vase painting by highlighting a selection of key objects, including the one at the NCMA that I mentioned earlier, this talk aims to situate the vase and their images in context as functional objects in antiquity and as art objects in the modern museum. I had really hoped to finally meet Naji in person in Raleigh. Unfortunately, due to a series of circumstances, this was not uh, possible. So I would like you to join me and welcome him, him virtually to North Carolina. Naji, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, Caroline, and uh, thanks to everyone who uh, is attending today. It's a, a great pleasure to be able to speak to you all 
uh, for the Friends of Greek Art lecture. Um, so I think what I'll do to start out is to say uh, a few words about how I'll arrange this lecture. Uh, I'll start out by situating uh, us, ourselves, I guess, my the audience, uh, both in terms of geography. And from there, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the whole range of representations of Africans in Greek art beyond Val's painting, just to give an idea of what's out there uh, beyond ceramics, uh, which do make up the bulk of the material, but there are other types of uh, objects and other media. Uh, and then from there, I'll sort of highlight a few objects uh, to give a sense of uh, what we have in terms of myth, what we have in terms of daily life. And then I'll look at how um, the material has been interpreted before, some of the problems with that, and then transition into uh, what I'm trying to look at in particular, uh, aspects that have not really been uh, explored to the extent that they might have been, uh, and how that fits into my work, um, and then sort of tie everything together uh, at that point. Uh, so uh, I'll go ahead and, if I can advance my slide, um, put up this map here, which I always like to do, uh, to show the geographic kind of context uh, in which we're operating um, with the material under discussion. So I'll just point out here, uh, for anyone who's not familiar uh, or doesn't have a, a, a incredibly tight grasp of the geography of the Mediterranean, uh, we generally think of ancient Greece as being this area here, uh, right? The, the mainland, the islands, this area. Uh, but the map that I put up shows that uh, ancient Greece really existed far beyond the confines of the mainland, far beyond the borders of what's the modern nation of Greece. There are Greek settlements, are the ones, of course, uh, in Europe, there are um, settlements and cities in Western Asia, and there are settlements and cities in North Africa. So I think it's important to emphasize that the Greek world, this uh, concept, uh, encompasses a vast geographic shores of uh, Indian, but also beyond, going as far to the northeast as, as the Black Sea, as you can see on the map, uh, and really over a long period. So you have earliest settlements in the ninth century BCE. What I'm really interested in are those in the sixth century BCE and those in the seventh. Most of my material comes in the sixth, though, and we can see from the red circles and the green triangles that these places uh, in North Africa are founded in the seventh and sixth centuries BCE. And that's important because that's the subject of uh, my study is looking at images of Africans in vase painting. And most of it begins to appear in the sixth century. So after Greeks have created settlements in North Africa, both in Egypt, as well as in Libya. So I think this is uh, a useful way to start things out, get, get us thinking uh, about the way that people and objects would have moved around the ancient Mediterranean and beyond. So from there, if we actually take a look at some of the types of objects that we get, starting again in the sixth century, uh, there is a whole range. Of them. So the two on the left belong, of course, to ceramics, uh, and I'll bring them back in later in the lecture. Uh, the first object is a perfume vase uh, that actually borrows its shape from uh, what's originally an Egyptian shape uh, called an alabastron. In Egypt, these would have been made out of alabaster stone, the sort of translucent, almost white stone. Um, and the Greeks adopt this shape uh, by a rather circuitous way, uh, as, as these things generally happen. Probably the shape traveled uh, off to the further east to Cyprus and then made its way uh, into the Greek islands to places like Samos, Chios, and from there uh, into the Greek mainland. And eventually 
to Athens, where you have a very robust industry where pottery is being produced. Uh, so this particular shape um, has a representation of an African uh, warrior on uh, one side. Sometimes they're paired with uh, Amazon figures, so these mythological uh, warrior women, but often they're just by themselves on one side, and then you'll have something like um, like a helmet or a palm tree on the other. So these perfume vessels would have held oil that was, was scented, it would have been uh, used in ancient Greece, it would have been a valuable kind of thing. So you have this here where you see the approach that the artist is used to show us this is as an African person. You can see uh, the very curly hair. They've actually made use of this light ground, uh, what we would call a white ground, uh, to actually use the darker slip, that mixture of clay and water that was used to decorate these to give the skin tone. Um, and so then you have another vase here, the drinking cup actually shows two different figures. On the one side, you have uh, an African male face, and then on the other, a female face. And here, there's obviously some kind of interest in physical difference. So you can see the contrast between the black color of the slip, again, a mixture of plain water, and then the red-orange, which is the color of Athenian clay. Um, this would have been used probably in what's called the symposium, which was a type of elite drinking party that was uh, part of the upper class culture in the city of Athens. Then moving beyond ceramics, we do get sculpture. So this is a relief, a uh, funerary relief that's currently in the city of Athens in the National Museum. And it shows what's probably, uh, again, a scene from daily life. I mentioned we have mythological scenes, representations, and we have daily life. So here you have um, a young African who seems to be a groom uh, handling this horse. Then you also have smaller scale representations in bronze, for example, uh, and I give you two here. Uh, so a statuette of a figure that's been identified as uh, based on his very short garment, kind of a, a loincloth um, type, um, piece of clothing as a, someone who would have been working in maybe a blacksmith shop, a smithy. So someone who would have been working with metal in a very sort of hot uh, environment. Uh, and this last figure with this sort of tunic type garment has been identified maybe as a young student or orator. Um, so you can see the range of material employed and you can also see uh, the range of dates. So most of these uh, are later than what I was initially talking about, the sixth century, although we will see a variety of material from that period. Uh, but these are from later. So we have the fifth century and then going all the way down to the second century BCE. So it's not something that just occurs in one period. It's really a sustained interest with uh, Africans as subjects in ancient Greek art. So if we look then at some more of the ceramics, um, we have, as I mentioned, mythological category. And Caroline actually talked about uh, one of the figures shown already, Memnon, uh, and we'll see uh, later on the vase in the North Carolina Museum of Art that shows Memnon. Uh, but this particular example is sort of the standard type for representing Memnon, king of Ethiopia. As he prepares to depart for Troy, he's accompanied by uh, two squires or warriors on either side, uh, and they, again, are given uh, very curly hair. Uh, they tend to have prominent uh, noses, lips, these facial features that uh, the artists have to rely on, because here, uh, the difference from when I showed that vase with the white ground and then the warrior done uh, in the black slip, the difference here is that all of the figures in the scene are shown using a black slip, right? This is what we call the black figure technique because all the figures are black. So when you have that situation where everyone is, you have to use really the physical traits to show uh, the difference. Uh, one of the things going on in these types of images that I think is interesting is that you never get to see what Memnon himself looks like. He's always wearing a helmet uh, and his face is obscured. So the question, 
uh, is is Memnon also himself, as you would think, he's from Ethiopia. Uh, is he also uh, similar physically to his squires, or is he not? Why is that, if that's the case? Uh, but there's this ambiguity that the, the artists have inserted here. And I'll just note at this point uh, for the vases that I show, uh, the information that I include, I always include what is going on on the vase and I give the date and then this information is the artist. So sometimes we know the artist, sometimes the vase is actually signed. That's something that happens with ancient Greek vases. Uh, so this vase is signed by the painter Exekias, that is his real name. And sometimes we don't know. And sometimes scholars have had to group these things and uh, look at various details and decoration in the way that parts of the body are drawn uh, and put together a grouping category for unsigned works. So this has been associated with the workshop of the Niobe painter, right? This is not the name of a real ancient Greek person, but this is the way that scholars have been able to group these things together. Um, so at this point, since I've moved on to this vase here, um, we have another example of a mythological type of scene. And so another character who is said to be from Ethiopia is the princess Andromeda. And Andromeda in mythology uh, is essentially unfairly punished for something that her mother Cassiopeia does. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, constellations, that may sound familiar, uh, Andromeda, Cassiopeia, right, things like this. Uh, Cassiopeia is the queen of Ethiopia. She's Andromeda's mother, and she brags that she's more beautiful than the Nereids. And the Nereids are, they're kind of divine. They live in the sea. They're um, associated with the, the circle of the god of the sea, Poseidon. So the Nereids, of course, get upset at this, and Poseidon decides to Andromeda by sending uh, a sea monster to attack the coasts of Ethiopia. And in order to appease the sea monster to stop this, uh, Andromeda's parents decide to sacrifice her to the sea monster. And so this is what you see here. Preparation for that. She's being bound up to be sacrificed. So here you have uh, her attendant figures, or I guess actually are her there are captors who are, who are tying her up to this post. Um, and they, they are shown, uh, again, as uh, physically as African figures. So you see, uh, and is using this white color to contrast against the black background uh, for the hair, which is very curly. And then they've used outline to create the bodies of the figures. Unfortunately, this is sort of uh, faded. Anytime you have added color, um, that's not the red of the clay or the black of the slip in vase painting. Uh, over time, it often is lost. So we see that this is faded, but these would have been fully outlined. And so you can see that here, the artists actually played with the, the background color, or rather the slip, to show skin color. And it is different in this case, because this is actually uh, a red figure vase, where the figures are in red, and that's been reversed. So this is the red of the clay, whereas over here, this was a bit black of slip, which is a mixture of clay and water that can be applied with a brush. So we see that contrast here that we don't have here, um, which is hidden here, even if we did have it. But here you can see the contrast between Andromeda and the two uh, African figures in the scene. Other things that we have- Najee, can in, I just interrupt uh, the, one the, quick second? Sure. Um, the sound is a little bit choppy on my end. Um, I think that might be the case for the participant. If you okay. turn off your camera, that might okay. help. Thank oh, you. Okay, sure, great. Okay, um, so a couple more of um, the mythological episodes that we have, and then we'll start talking about daily life. Um, not all of the figures are necessarily shown in the same way. So we have two myths involving the hero Heracles. Uh, you may know him as Hercules, the son of the god Zeus. Um, and he's shown in mythological episodes set in Africa. So the one on the left is a representation of him 
wrestling this figure uh, with this very long beard here uh, and rather shaggy hair um, known as Antaeus. And Antaeus is uh, a Libyan giant who is known for accosting travelers as they travel close to his home in Libya. And he challenges them to wrestle. And he then rather sort of in a grim way is using them, their bodies after he's killed them because he's very strong uh, to adorn the temple of the god Poseidon, who is his father. And Heracles is traveling through Libya at one point in the process of completing uh, his labors, these tasks that he has been given, uh, which I don't have time to get into um, too much, but he is accosted by Antaeus and he is challenged to wrestle. And since Heracles is Heracles uh, and is known for his superhuman strength, uh, he wrestles Antaeus and he figures out how to beat him. He has to lift Antaeus up off the ground because Antaeus is uh, the son of the earth in addition to the sun Poseidon, and he derives strength from being in contact with the ground so Heracles figures out that if he can lift him off the ground then he can physically crush Antaeus so we see the prelude to that here you can see Antaeus' hand is still on the ground uh, Heracles has to lift him up has to uh, crush him uh, once he's off the earth so we see this in Vaz painting there's uh, about 40 or 50 of these. There's quite a significant number. Uh, and you can see the physical difference is articulated here through uh, the hair and the beard uh, and the expression. So he has a very neat beard uh, and very well coiffed hair. And Tyus has a very long pointed beard, a very long mustache and this long shaggy hair. Uh, he also has his teeth bared. Uh, so again, very different from uh, Heracles. And later on, we'll see how this relates to uh, Egyptian art, uh, as a matter of fact. It's one of the things I'm interested in. Um, before I get to that, later on, uh, I'll move to, this is the myth of Heracles and Osiris. So in his travels, Heracles goes to Libya, he then goes to Egypt, and he encounters mythological king of Egypt, of fair Egypt, and he goes to a fortune teller, not a fortune teller, excuse me, a seer, um, to figure out how to stop the drought. Then the seer says that he has to sacrifice the first foreigner who visits Egypt every year. Um, so unfortunately for Heracles one year, uh, he is the first foreigner to visit, and so Musiris decides to sacrifice him. Well, again, bad decision on the part of Musiris, uh, since this is Heracles. Uh, Heracles does not wish to be sacrificed, and he fights Musiris and his priest, and he defeats them. And so we see that here, this clash between Heracles, who is shown here at the left skin, these are some of the things associated with him. And you see the priests here, right? There's an altar uh, to indicate that they were going to sacrifice him. Uh, and he uh, is shown grabbing this one priest, and there's others here. Uh, and again, and they're shown here in this particular one, they have very curly hair, very prominent facial features, and they're shown as Africans. Again, since we're now having all the figures in one color, you have to use other ways to show the differences between them. Sorry. So now we'll go ahead and take a look uh, again at some of the things that either are in daily life or things I talked a little bit about that don't necessarily fit entirely. Um, so one scene that is rooted in daily life and will remind you of that uh, funerary relief that I showed um, is this vase that is showing us, um, again, a groom and a horse. So you have this young African groom with a horse here. Um, so maybe this was a common profession uh, in Athens for people who made their way to the city of Athens from Africa uh, to work with horses. Um, this is, again, the second image that I've shown that depicts this kind of interaction. Um, and you can see that very nicely done here uh, in the center of the inside of this cup, um, which is a drinking cup. And this is uh, in New York, the Metropolitan Museum. Um, I already showed these two um, 
uh, vases, but I will just say that um, it's unclear whether they should be fit into the realm of mythology or daily life. So is this meant to be uh, uh, just a warrior, maybe a mercenary or a warrior in a, uh, a foreign army? It's unclear. The ones that are with paired with Amazon on the other side, people think maybe they're meant to represent mythological African warriors, so maybe some of King Memnon's warriors. Uh, we don't know for sure. So they could be mythological, they could be daily life. Uh, another example with the cup, uh, what are we looking at here? Is this supposed to be some kind of mythological representation or is it a more generic kind of depiction? Um, scholars have pointed to the decoration here on the woman's uh, headdress, which is uh, ivy, which is associated with the god of wine, Dionysus. So maybe are we looking at their, his attendance? Uh, it's unclear, but uh, there's on the one hand, mythological representations, things from daily life and things that could go on. So how have scholars actually studied this material? How have, has this been interpreted? Uh, I wanna briefly or talk about the early sort of interpretations and then move on to the ones that have been a lot more more influential uh, and that continue to shape how the material is presented. Uh, but to give you an idea of how these vases were discussed, let's say a hundred years ago, um, I talked briefly about the first kind of major work on this that was done uh, in the 1920s by a scholar named Grace Beardsley, who studied these for her PhD thesis at Johns Hopkins University. And she didn't have as much material as there is now. Uh, she also didn't just look at clauses. She looked at all kinds of things. But as you can see from the two quotes that I pull here, uh, and I've tried not to put a ton of text in this presentation, uh, just some choice books at various points. Um, it's very clear that she's associating these objects with representations of modern uh, Black people that were racist caricatures from the 19th century. Uh, she sees these as being similar to those, even though we're operating in a totally different context in ancient Greece and the kinds of uh, historical developments and events that shaped things like um, the slave trade in the Americas and the way that uh, attitudes developed toward Black people, totally separate things, right? But she's conflating the two and she treats objects like this, which is a drinking horn. Uh, so again, a drinking vessel, which shows um, a young African being attacked by a crocodile. Uh, again, getting us to think Egypt because crocodiles were uh, a well-known danger in Egypt along the Nile. Uh, but this scholar treats them as comic and examples of mockery, right? Uh, so this is sort of the baggage, the intellectual baggage that's involved in studying this kind of material. So there was negative reaction to this, uh, as you could imagine, from uh, prominent Black intellectuals in the United States. Uh, just one example, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, who is probably one of the most famous uh, black intellectuals of the 20th century, one of the most uh, influential, um, was interested in uh, um, references to black, what he calls here uh, references to Negroes and black folk in Greek and Latin literature. And so he was looking for references that he could use that were not like what Beardsley was doing. And in this letter, he writes to a scholar named Frank Snowden, who was a classicist and a former colleague of Du Bois's and a specialist on the subject, asking for this evidence that he could use that's discussed in a way that's different than Beardsley's work. Uh, du Bois was very scathing in his assessment of Beardsley's work and called it uh, a combination, he called it a stupid combination of scholarship and race prejudice. So he's looking for this uh, material framed in such a way that is is not laden with the modern kinds of anachronistic interpretations. And so at this point, it's good to actually introduce Frank Snowden because he is such a figure in the study of this material. 
Um, he, for many years, was a professor at Howard University uh, in Washington, D.C., and he was also uh, a diplomat. He lectured widely for the U.S. Department of State uh, for many years uh, and was a, an important figure in the uh, State Department program for advancing civil rights in the second half of the 20th century. And so you see here a variety of, of images of Snowden at various points in his life. Um, he lived a very long life. And because of that, uh, his influence still lingers in how the objects are discussed and interpreted. Uh, so what Snowden did was look at the vases and he was interested in how both ancient Greeks and Romans represented uh, people from Africa, what the Greeks and Romans called Ethiopians, right? Uh, so this term that they used to sort of generically refer to Africa to the south of Egypt. Uh, this was their sort of experience of Africa. They did not have knowledge for the most part, as far as we can tell, of the entire continent. They were familiar with uh, North Africa, and they were also familiar with some of the areas immediately to the south of it. Uh, and so those areas they referred to as Ethiopia. So you see Snowden retaining that term here. So he starts writing about this in the 1940s and continues to write um, all the way into the 1990s. These are his two books uh, from 1970 and 83. And he has a very specific way uh, of looking at the material, which I'll get into in a, in a second. Uh, he also contributed to this major volume that's part of a larger series that looks at depictions of, of Black people in art uh, across time, antiquity, all the way up through uh, more modern eras, uh, the image of the Black and Western art. Um, and this, as you can see, was recently updated uh, just over 10 years ago. So uh, even though Snowden um, passed away in 2000, now, 15 years later, he's very influential. And on the one hand, I think, uh, that's great because Snowden was one of the few Black classicists for most of the second half of the 20th century who was uh, a professional academic. Um, but on the other hand, we'll see that um, he too was operating in some ways in the same way as Beardsley, even though he was operating for different sort of ends. So I think here Snowden's use of uh, uh, racial anthropology in discussing the material. So where Beardsley was talking about these things in a racist fashion, Snowden takes scholarship that's long been discredited. It was even in the process of being discredited when he was writing these sort of racial categories and um, typologies that were put together by anthropologists in the, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He actually uses these to show that the ancient Greek artists were quite accurate in the way that they represented, um, represented what he calls Ethiopians, right, uh, in his books. Uh, so he actually compares um, specific objects to representations of real people, to photographs, to these ethnographic images in various places. Uh, and so I just give you two of the quotes here. He talks about the anthropological gallery. Uh, he talks in very specific terms uh, about physical characteristics to show that the representations of the ancient images are true to life. They're faithful depictions of people and how they looked. And he does this to say that they're actually not meant to be racist characters. So this is one example of that. Um, he does it again in other places. So he really likes these three-dimensional vessels, uh, what we call plastic vases because of the three-dimensional decoration that are in the form of human faces. Uh, so in addition to the one that I showed earlier that showed an African man and a woman, uh, you have a lot there are these single figures. Uh, and so this one again is a perfume vessel, uh, an aribalos, uh, and then this is a, a drinking cup. Um, and so he talks about the pronounced type Right, these anthropological terms that uh, he's borrowing to discuss the realistic quality of these images. 
And just one more example of that to actually compare. He actually pulls uh, in his second book photographs from these uh, anthropological books on racial categorization that incorporates them and juxtaposes them with objects. So it very much is this um, trend that you see in his work to use racial anthropology from the 30s, uh, even in the 1970s and 80s. This is from his second book. He does this. So this is 1983, and a lot of this has long been discredited, but it's useful for him to continue to use it to talk about uh, the material to sort of uh, advance what he wants to prove about the objects. So we'll now leave Snowden behind uh, and come back to uh, the objects that I am looking at uh, and trying to uh, say more about than has been said. Um, and so that's what I'll spend the remainder of the time doing and highlighting specific things, looking at uh, issues that I want to explore further in, in my own research. So I bring back in um, these representations of Osiris in Egypt, and I show you a, another example. Um, so you can see, uh, again, we have probably about 40 of these objects, so there's a fair number of them. Uh, so we have a different example here, uh, but the same kind of thing, right? Uh, Heracles, the priests, uh, sort of. So we see that Heracles here is nude. He's dressed in this one. Um, but then we see that the artist uses this as a way to show difference. So the priests have shaven heads. They look very different from Heracles, uh, but they wear these sort of linen outfits, um, which generally are referred to as the Calisiris. Um, I don't know if that's entirely accurate. That's how Greek scholarship it refers to it, um, but it's used to emphasize their uh, their genitalia, right? To show that the priests are circumcised, whereas Heracles is not. Uh, so again, these different things that are used to show uh, that we're looking at people from different places. Um, what's interesting about these that I'd like to pursue further, and I am, uh, is that the positioning of Heracles in all of these scenes uh, whether he's using his club or whether he is in this case using one of the priests, rather an unfortunate altar. Um, what's going on uh, in these vessels, and these are uh, specific shapes that would have been used uh, for holding wine, for example, this vase here, um, and this one I already showed is a hydria, so it's a water vase. Um, what's interesting about the representation of Heracles is that uh, it's borrowed from Egyptian art. And you can see just one example uh, of what's called the pharaoh smiting his enemies, which is a very ancient trope that goes back to the beginning of pharaonic art in Egypt. And it gets picked up and incorporated into Greek vase painting. Uh, so you can see here on the right, Tuthmos III smiting his enemies. This is the Temple of Karnak. Uh, and it's much earlier than vase painting. It's from the 14th century. Um, but again, if we think back to that map that I showed, uh, there are Greeks in Egypt beginning in the 7th century. Um, there are Greeks in North Africa more generally starting in the 6th century. Um, so they're clearly either people there who are seeing these things, right? This is a large scale public art. This is just one example of this kind of imagery. Um, so that's one avenue, people actually being in Egypt, uh, maybe some of them even are artists and they eventually end up in Greece, uh, or there's maybe object circulating with this kind of imagery, but somehow it ends up in boss painting, uh, which I think is incredibly interesting. Um, so it's essentially, placing Heracles in the position of the pharaoh, right? Uh, you have this aggressive striding stance, the grabbing of the figure, the wielding of the club. Uh, here, Tuthmos would have been wielding a mace. You can see the top of it, part of it's missing. Um, but the Egyptians, uh, uh, the Egyptian iconography is used uh, and inverted. So Heracles is in the place of the pharaoh and the Egyptians are the enemies being smited. Uh, what's going on there, I haven't really figured out yet, but uh, it's something that I'm working on. Uh, and you see, as far as objects circulating, 
uh, how that could have worked. Uh, so you see here um, this Phoenician bowl that was a type of object that circulated widely in the ancient Mediterranean. This one from a bit earlier in the seventh century, but again, it has that kind of iconography, the Pharaoh smiting enemies. This one's actually from Italy, which is interesting because a lot of the vases that I've shown, these nice complete examples, would have come from Etruscan tombs. So I don't have time to say a lot about the Etruscans, but the Etruscans were um, one of these Italic peoples that lived in Italy. Um, and they were in contact with the Greeks and the Phoenicians and trading with both. And they consumed Greek pottery in massive quantities. So there's some kind of, you know, this flow of objects uh, is, is stimulating these, these interconnections, I'm pretty sure. So at this point, uh, we'll look at uh, just one more set of vases for the mythological things in Egypt. And I'll move on to the very last stretch of things uh, in my talk today. Um, and so here again, I show you the uh, entire uh, uh, myth. So I give you another example. Again, in this cup, this drinking cup, the same kind of elements as on this larger vase, this crater, this vessel that would have been used for mixing wine and water. Um, you see the long beard, sort of shaggier hair. Unfortunately, this one's sort of damaged, but uh, you get the same kind of effect, right? The contrast between Heracles here and the giant Antaeus. This is interesting to me as well because it also has a similar, uh, I think, kind of transmission, this imagery, Egyptian art, because Egyptians represented foreigners in their own art. And they represented uh, certain groups of people that they were typically seen as uh, making up the rest of the world. So in Egyptian art, you had, uh, in addition to uh, Nubians, you had Libyans and people from Western Asia. And so here you see uh, on the left, a reconstruction on the right, the actual monument, a representation of Ramses II, uh, essentially killing two Libyans. And so if you notice, you can see them better in the reconstruction, but you can kind of see it here on this figure who he's trampling. They have these pointed beards. Uh, and I think that that is probably something that the Greek artist would have seen or there would have been some kind of transmission of this imagery that ultimately gets us to here, to write these long kind of beards that are different than what Heracles has, right? This is a little bit pointed. Uh, but here it's very prominent and exaggerated. So I think there's this kind of connection to Egyptian art that is happening that results in some of these representations. So now, and I think actually we'll have to uh, skip over a few things, um, but uh, I wanted to come to uh, the vase in the North Carolina Museum of Art that uh, is to me very interesting that has the Memnon iconography. Because as I mentioned, and I guess I should go back <laughs> to show the difference. As I mentioned, this is the kind of standard representation here on the left, this vase by Exekias, where we see uh, the figure standing in the center, the king, he's flanked by his two African warriors. Well, in the North Carolina example, um, you get a similar kind of setup, except Memnon is standing next to his African warrior, and you have these two horsemen. As far as I can tell, um, this is the only instance of this approach to the iconography. Um, this is unique. Now, I say that as far as I can tell, you know, I say that now, and who knows, five years from now, there might be another example that shows up. But for the moment, this is the only known example where the iconography is approached in this way. Um, you can see that they're very similar. Uh, these are by different artists, though. And I had to look very closely to tell the difference uh, because they are very, this is also very what we would call Exekian, right? So while it's not by Exekias, it's very much in the same kind of mode, right? You see the decoration, uh, the ornament, the arrangement. However, um, when you actually look closely, the name of the group, the three line group, because this is not a signed vase, this has been given a group by a scholar. The three line group is an accurate name because you see these 
lines that separate the decoration down here, they always have three of them. And I actually had to count on the vase by Ezekias. There are not three. <laughs> there are two here. I think there's maybe four here. It's not consistent. But this group, and this is how one of the ways that scholars organize these vases is by looking at these details. Uh, there's always three lines separating the decoration here. Um, so it's nice in my mind, in terms of the iconography, that we have a unified kind of composition for the whole object. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes um, when vase painting, you'll get one scene that is very clearly the main scene, and you'll get a scene that's sort of generic. So it'll be, you know, some people standing at a well or something like that. Whereas on the other side, you have gods and heroes. Here, I think these go together, excuse me, go together quite well because you have scenes of departure. So on one side, you have the departure of Memnon. So Memnon here in the center with his African squire and then two mounted uh, horsemen. And then on the other side, you have the departure of Heracles. So Heracles, we've mentioned already. So you have Heracles, uh, and he's attended by Athena, the goddess Athena, who we know is Athena by her spear and her helmet. Uh, and then the god Hermes, who we can identify by his distinctive traveler's cap and his staff here. Um, so it's a nice unified composition. They're both important heroes. Memnon is, is from Ethiopia and Africa. I've already shown you that Heracles uh, is uh, associated with myths that take place in Africa. So it's a nice overall composition. Um, also, uh, as Caroline mentioned, she reached out to me as uh, someone who is an expert on the subject matter. Uh, and I've actually come up with a label for this vase, uh, thinking about uh, you know, some of the things I mentioned about earlier ways of writing about and interpreting these, coming up with a way that is accurate and that is suitable now for the 21st century. Uh, and so I show you that uh, description here. And um, it was a great opportunity for me. It was an opportunity to learn how uh, we as scholars have to talk about material uh, in a way that's accurate and clear and that makes sense for a wide public, people who are interested in this material who do not sit around all day like I do looking at this, um, looking at these objects and, and reading up them. So I show you that here. Um, and I think this is a nice way to end things uh, with the vase that's in the North Carolina Museum of Art. Um, at this point, I'll just uh, bring Snowden back in then, who I mentioned, uh, and I'll highlight what he says about needing a fresh look at these modern uh, interpretations of the ancient evidence. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I've been doing for the past few years. Uh, and hopefully that has come across in this talk and uh, it's uh, something that I hope people have found uh, enga engaging and compelling. So at this point, I'll just thank uh, all of the various institutions that have supported this research over the years. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone uh, for attending. And I am uh, happy to answer some questions now. Well, thank you very much, Najee, for this wonderful um, presentation. Um, I really like that you ended with the NCMA uh, vase. Um, this will be prominently displayed um, in our galleries. And lo and behold, as you walk into the room, it is King Memnon that we will see, not Heracles. Um, I would like to invite um, everyone to place questions in the chat. Uh, if you have any, and um, I'm going to ask you one, Najee, while people are thinking about their questions. Um, we've seen on like on our vase here at the NTMA and some of the others that you've shown, we have King Memnon on one side and on the other side we have Heracles. Um, is that like the most common sort of A side, B side combination? Or do we see King Memnon with other types of mytholo mythological 
Yeah, so that's a, a good question. Um, it actually depends. Um, there's not a ton of these vases. Um, there's probably, from what I found, about 10 or 12 of them, of that specific, of that specific representation of them. There are others where he's not shown with his African squires, um, and those are a bit different. But for the ones where he is, um, sometimes you get Heracles on the reverse. Um, there's a couple where you actually get other scenes from the Trojan War. Uh, so you'll have other heroes on the reverse uh, that show battles set at the Trojan War. Uh, and then sometimes you just get the generic iconography. So you'll get, again, some people standing around and it doesn't seem to have a mythological connection. Um, so there's not always a connection between the two sides, but um, I would say, I, I don't know that it would be the overwhelming majority that are Heracles, but they, they're definitely there. Thank you. Do we have any questions from our participants? And thank you again, Naji, for this illuminating talk. I think it's um, important that both scholars and curators um, always update, like review material and present it in a different way as we're um, doing at the museum with their installation. I see a question in the chat. Let's see. Um, I have a question here. In sculpture, Heracles is typically has a lion skin. Why not in pottery? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think it really depends. Um, so sometimes he does have the lion skin uh, and sometimes not. Uh, sometimes what will happen is um, he won't always be wearing it. So I think in one of the examples I showed the, where he's wrestling the giant Antaeus, I think it's there, it's just off to the side and can't really, it's like it'll be hung up off to the side or it'll be in the background somewhere. Um, but usually the way that uh, in vase painting it works, the artists want just at least one thing that tells us it's Heracles. Uh, so if you have more than one, that's great. So if you have the lion skin and the club, sometimes you'll get just the lion skin, sometimes you'll just get the club and either of those is enough. Um, so I think, and you know, there, a lot of times we try to figure out why do they do it this way uh, for certain scenes and not others. Um, there doesn't really seem to be a, a logic to it. Um, it's just, you know, the boss painters had a lot of freedom in how they worked. Uh, so they might just have decided to do it that way for a particular composition uh, and not for another. So just keeping on that same theme, when we have King Memnon, as you mentioned, he typically wears his helmet, so you don't yeah. see his face. Yeah. So it's it's really like the people accompanying him that tell us this is actually King Memnon, King of Ethiopia. Right, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, other, it's otherwise it's difficult to tell. Uh, so in the scenes where he does not have any of his, his African squires. Um, the only way you can tell is if he has a label. So the vase painters, in addition to signing their vases, sometimes they will label the figures in the scene. So they'll write them on, uh, or they'll write Heracles. Um, there's that, or sometimes it will be shown with his mother, who is Aos, and she's the goddess of the dawn, and she's winged. She has wings, and so if she's present, then and it's a, a sort of battle scene or a scene of, of fighting, then scholars can generally say this is probably Memnon since in the mythology, uh, after he's killed in battle, his mother carries him away. Uh, but yeah, you have, to, you have to have other things in the scene to be able to tell it's Memnon because otherwise he himself is kind of generic. Yeah, yeah, he looks like any other soldier with the yeah, helmet right, and the shield, right. yeah. Any other questions from the participants? You have a question though, Diane. <laughs> I was going to have an appreciation. I really loved seeing the um, connections with Egyptian, and I'm afraid to call it art, but uh, Egyptian material culture. Caroline will continue to explain to us the connection between art and material culture. But I thought that was so interesting to see the connections between Heracles' posture and the uh, Pharaoh's posture. And it was just kind of mind blowing because I've never made that connection before. So that's just one of many mind blowing insights. 
Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Well, Nazi, thank you so very much for this wonderful lecture. Um, and we will see your label in the new galleries that uh, open next weekend, so in a week. Ah! Oh, um. wonderful. <laughs> I will have to get down there at some point. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We have to find a way to bring you over. Yeah. Virginia is not that far. but No, it's New not. York. No. Yeah. 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 And even New York, it's uh, when the airport is working for properly, uh, it's an easy day trip. Yes. Yeah. Well, I wanted to thank um, everybody again for joining us today for this wonderful uh, lecture. We hope to see you again soon for some other ancient material culture related um, events, uh, probably next spring. Um, Naji, again, thank you a million times for joining us um, today. Luke, thank you for uh, all the tech stuff you've done in the background. And we'll see everybody um, later, hopefully in person. If not, uh, we'll see you virtually. Thank you so much. <laughs>